So we're going to uh, continue the discussion of fault-tolerant quantum computation with Robert Rosendorf. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, welcome to our third tutorial lecture on quantum error correction. We are getting a bit more specialized now. Namely, we will be talking about two-dimensional architectures and fault-tolerant quantum computers with a geometric constraint, namely when only nearest neighbors can interact. Okay, so uh, what you see, uh, I have to handle with two hands a micro, a pointer, and a clicking device. So let's see. Okay, but you recognize what this is. This is a coffee mug posing as a donut. And you know what that is. You think, well, that must be topological quantum computation, but it is not. Um, we will be talking here about fault-tolerant quantum computation, a conventional setting, so we are not naturally protected against errors. We have to do something to protect against errors uh, in an active way. So our systems will be, per se, not topological. They will just be lattices of conventional qubits. But the methods that we choose to correct errors in those systems will be topological. And what is certainly true is that uh, the experimental setting or the, the type of qubit carries the physical realization that we use to realize quantum computation will influence the architecture that we are going to end up with and will influence the methods that we will use to implement fault-tolerant quantum computation and quantum error correction. So let me discuss this in slightly more detail. So for example, we could think of our being carried by photons. Well, in that case, you're not likely to have a geometric constraint. Well, the most pro problematic things about photons is to have them interact. So you need to think about that. But your qubits, they could live anywhere, and then you could use optical fibers or whatever uh, to shuttle between places. So if you're discussing photons as your <laughs> carrier of qubits, you can afford a global architecture. Everybody can interact with everybody else. Now if you move into other systems like cold atoms and optical lattices or ion traps, now suddenly shorter distance gates become preferable over longer distance gates. And the, well, something that would be very nice would, have, would be to have arrays of superconducting qubits. Well, the natural arena for those guys is to live on a cylinder or on some other waiver. So you're two-dimensional. And now local interaction or short-range interaction is very preferable. So you will be thinking about a local architecture. And um, I will make precise the setting, the local setting that I want to discuss here in this lecture. But before I get to that, let me just brief, briefly remind you uh, what we need to know about fault-tolerant quantum computation for the purpose of this talk. And we have he we've heard about it already in Andrew's talk. Let me just summarize very quickly. So fault-tolerant quantum computation is the art of keeping up a quantum speed up in the presence of decoherence. So decoherence is a debilitating quantum computation. So, so you need to do something to prevent it. And we are in a very fortunate situation here, namely we can do something against decoherence in the circuit model, uh, sort of system models. And the, the very important or most important uh, result in this area is the so-called threshold theorem. And it tells us that if we can manage to reduce the error per elementary operation below a certain threshold, then we can compute arbitrarily long and arbitrarily accurate. Okay, so that leaves us with two questions. Namely, so what is this value? What is this threshold that we have to beat? And also, what's the operational cost of doing all this? And, well, these are the two questions that I would like to address today for this particular local setting. So let's go back uh, to the setting and uh, uh, let me specify what I will be talking about. So again, we are looking at a two-dimensional setting, say just a, a grid of in which only nearest neighboring qubits are allowed to interact. 
And that is, as I said, relevant uh, for superconducting qubits, quantum dots, optical lattices, and to a lesser is, uh, extent, also for segmented ion traps, although here you have more options. So uh, let me get back. I skipped the outline slide, so let, uh, let me go over that now. So I hope I just gave you uh, the motivation for, what I'm, for why I'm going to talk about those two-dimensional architectures. They are uh, rel relevant in many physical systems. And what I'm going to do with my talk today is I just want to present to you two constructions, two topological constructions for handling this <coughs> geometric constraint of nearest neighbor action, interaction in two dimensions. So the first construction that I'm going to present to you is based on the so-called surface codes, which have been around a couple of years now. And the other construction uh, is considerably newer. It's only about one year old. It has been uh, suggested by Hector Bombin as the so-called topological color subsystem codes. And this second construction is con considerably more intricate. And therefore, I will just, between those two constructions, I just will pull out uh, several elements of the second construction, namely the twists, color, and subsystem codes, subsystem codes you have already heard about in Todd's lecture this morning, and, well, discuss those aspects separately in simpler settings before we then get back and discuss the, the, the full example. And I will conclude with some remarks. So that's the outline uh, for my uh, uh, tutorial today. So, yeah, so what I want to do with it is I, yeah, I want to show you instructions and hopefully you can find some beauty in them and maybe that inspires you to come up with your own construction and maybe contribute to this field. So let me begin with the first of those constructions, which is, which is based on, on the surface code. So, um, so the surface codes have been invented by Alexei Kitayev around 1997, and they are stabilizer codes. Uh, more precisely, they are CSS codes, which makes them already nice. But then in addition, uh, the stabilizer generators are close to local, which makes them very <coughs> suitable uh, for our architecture, and I will e expand on that uh, later. So this is the first idea that goes in here. Those service codes are perfectly suited for our two-dimensional nearest neighbor setting. But, um, yeah, just error correction is just half of the story. We also need to think how to do quantum gates <coughs> in such a setting. And it turns out that there's a topological uh, way of doing quantum gates in this setting. Namely, what we will be doing is we will be punching holes in the code surface, in this way creating boundary. And this will provide us with encoded qubits in that surface, and then we take those holes and move them ar around, fairly similar to what is done in topological quantum computing. And by braiding those holes in the code <coughs> surface, we will be able to realize topological quantum gates. So those are the two aspects of the construction that I would like to illustrate here in some greater detail. Okay, so let me begin um, defining the surface codes. So what we need for them is two-dimensional lattice with the qubits living on the edges of the lattice. So the qubits live here. What we next need to define for a stabilizer code the stabilizer generators and the encoded Pauli operators. So for a CSS, CSS codes, the stabilizer generator come in two kinds, Z-type and X-type. And the Z-type stabilizers are associated with the plaquettes. Namely, we pick a plaquette and then the corresponding stabilizer generator is a four-fold tensor product of sigma Zs on the edges around the plaquette like this. And likewise, the X-type <coughs> stabilizers are associated with the sites of the lattice. And, well, in fact, they consist of the tensor product of four Pauli operators, four, four spin flip operators, sigma X, uh, next to a site, like this. And you can easily check that all those operators actually commute as they are supposed to. Am I, am I holding the micro right? Can you hear me from the back? 
Yeah, is that okay? Good. Thank you. Okay, so, so much about the stabilizer generators. Now, what are the encoded Pauli operators like? Well, in this surface here, where we have specific boundary conditions, I haven't talked about the boundary yet, I will do that later. The encoded Pauli operators are, have a geometric shape, namely that of a string. So in case of the encoded Pauli operator sigma z, it, it runs from left to right across the entire lattice. And the, for the encoded Pauli operator sigma x, it runs from top to bottom across the entire lattice. So now, what is topological about these codes? Well, so the first topological aspect that you see, we could consider different types of surfaces, say, without boundary, but homologically non-trivial ones, with a genus, with a non-vanishing genus, that is, with handles in them. And then it turns out that the number of qubits, encoded qubits, that I can put into such a surface depends only on the genus. That is, it depends only on the topology of the surface, but not on the size. Another topological aspect that I find here with those codes is, well, I said, this string of Zs corresponds to an encoded Z operator. Z and Z is confusing me. I hope both is understandable. Anyway, so it's not just that string. It could be any string that runs from left to right. And in, in a more mathematical fashion, I can uh, deform such a string uh, by in a homological fashion. That is by adding the boundary of and the resulting string would still represent the same encoded operator, sigma z. So this encoded operator is represented by a whole homology class <coughs> of strings. Okay. okay, so the um, the quantum error correction or fault, yeah, quantum error correction with those codes is well studied, and you could ask. Well, it's nice that they are already stabilizer codes. We know that as soon as we're dealing with a stabilizer code, code a whole machinery uh, of discussing quantum error correction <coughs> becomes available to us. But now we have this topological picture, this picture of homology in addition. So we, we may ask ourselves, is there anything addition, in addition that we get out of this topological picture? And the answer is yes. And uh, Andrew alluded to this before. We can map uh, the success, or we, we may discuss the success of quantum error correction in this setting in terms of a statistical, uh, uh, classical statistics mechanics model, namely the so-called random plaquette Z2 gauge model. So we can study quantum error correction by drawing phase diagrams uh, of those statmec models, which of course doesn't make it any easier, but it's a nice connection anyway. And also, as Andrew has pointed out, for this part particular topological quantum code, the surface code, quantum error correction, or the, the excuse me, the, proce the classical procedure needed to be run for quantum error correction is actually efficient. And we have known this for a long time, uh, this minimum uh, perfect uh, chain matching that Andrew alluded to uh, is also known as Edmonds algorithm and dates back to the 60s. So, uh, it has been, even before quantum computation, the necessary mathematical tools have been invented to deal with this setting. But uh, other, the error correction other topological quantum codes is more difficult than this, and it's a, a very recent advance in quantum error correction theory uh, that has led to efficient uh, quantum error correction protocols for those other topological quantum codes. And you will hear about this at this conference. Uh, in two talks by uh, Hector Bombin and uh, Guillaume Douglas Gianchi from Sherbrooke. Okay, and yeah, that was a little detour. What I wanted to say is that the error correction for those codes is well, well studied and we have efficient algorithms for quantum error correction with them. Okay, so let me now leave error correction for a moment and think about encode qubits in those surfaces. So as I already said, we can encode qubits by going to homologic, oops, 
by going to uh, cohomologically uh, non-trivial surfaces, but maybe that's too complicated uh, for experiments, so that's not what we want to do here. We want to stick with the plane. But the plane in itself does not offer the, the support for any qubits, so what we need to do is we need to introduce some boundary. So we can use the segment of a plane with special boundary to encode one qubit, and you've seen this before, but one qubit isn't enough. So what we're going to do is uh, we take, we are punching holes into the code surface. And I will, uh, I will explain on the next slide what that is. And then the way we handle the situation, a pair of holes will constitute a qubit. You see here already in this drawing, and you will see more of that, is the encoded Pauli operators. So one encoded Pauli operator, the encoded Z here, will encircle one of the holes and the other Pauli operator will stretch between them. Okay. So let me define now uh, in more detail what those holes are. So those holes are just missing stabilizers. So, um, so stabilizers, as I said earlier, come in two kinds. Namely, we have side stabilizers and plaquette stabilizers. So a, what we call a primal hole is just a side stabilizer that's not enforced. So we're removing a generator from the stabilizer. The stabilizer shrinks, number of qubits stays the same. So this gives room to have, well, encoded qubits. Likewise for the plaquette operators. What we call a dual hole is just a missing plaquette stabilizer. So we remove this plaquette operator from the stabilizer. And then pairs of plaquette, missing plaquette stabilizers, pairs of dual holes will support a dual qubit, and pairs of missing side stabilizers, uh, that is pairs of primal holes, will support a primal qubit. Okay, so let us now look at those qubits, those encoded qubits. So what you see here is two primal holes with their boundary, and now the encoded Z is a string that runs from one hole to the other, whereas the encoded X is a string that loops around one of the holes. That was for the primal qubit. Now let's look at the dual qubit, supported by <coughs> two dual holes. The X-type string is running between the holes and the Z-type string, the encoded Z, is looping around one of the holes. <coughs> so when we look at this, those two <coughs> pictures, we can uh, infer the following rules. Namely, an X-type chain cannot end in a primal hole, but it can end in a dual hole. The Z-type chain can end <coughs> in primal holes, but it cannot end in the dual holes. It has to loop around, around the dual holes. So these are the, uh, the topological rules we have to respect here. And now we want to use them. Namely, I want to explain to you how a C node works for this code. Okay, so what you see here in this drawing is just uh, the code surface with the holes punched into it. So here we have two primal holes, that is the support for a primal qubit. Here we have two dual support for the dual qubit. And this axis is just time, so here those uh, holes are just moving parallel, so nothing happens. It's just storage. Okay, now we <coughs> braid them and we ask, okay, anything interesting happening here? And it, indeed, this configuration is suitable to realize a controlled NOT gate. And actually, this is something that I can show to you with what I have introduced. Okay. So that goes as follows. So uh, let's consider this string here, this X-type string running between two dual holes. Okay, so let's go to our <coughs> table that we, that we discussed earlier. So we find, yeah, an X-string running between two dual holes is actually possible, and it represents an encoded X operator. So what we're now going to do with this thing is we slide it forward in time and see what happens. And to respect those rules, namely, the endpoints of that string must always remain attached <coughs> to those dual holes, and they can never end in a primal hole. Okay, so let's 
get going. You move this thing forward, nothing much happens uh, at the beginning, so the ends remain attached, but now this primal hole starts coming in the way and the string has to avoid it, so the string must recede and bulge out. So now, the, by now, the, the primal hole has really come very much in the way, which means that the, this X-type string now has to loop around it before it can end in the other dual hole. And so finally, this loop here cuts off, and at the end of the day, we, we are left with, with an X-type string around a primal hole, uh, I mean a closed loop, and a string in between the, the two dual holes. So now we go back to our table up here and try to figure out what that is. So that, as it was before, is an X, encoded X operator on the dual qubit, and this loop here is an X operator on the primal qubit. So we've seen that on the forward propagation, this operator has changed from a local operator to a, a two-local operator, a non-local operator, and this is the signature for an entangling gate. And in completely the same fashion, we can examine the other three Pauli operators, I mean the, the other x and the two z's, and we find those propagation relations in, in exactly the same way, and this tells us that we're dealing with the c naught gate here. And, yeah, so we can now ask, what can we do here with this code in a topological manner? Um, and it's not actually that much. It's, it's certainly not universal. But what we can do is the CNOT, and I've shown you a simplified version of it a minute ago. Uh, this one is a bit more complicated because you want to do a CNOT also between two qubits of the same kind. So the, the, the previous CNOT involved a dual and a primal qubit. You want to show that you can do a CNOT also between two, two qubits of the same kind. Well, anyway, we can do the CNOT. We can prepare and me we can prepare and measure in the Z eigenbasis, and we can prepare and measure in the X eigenbasis. Yeah, but that's as I just said, it's not universal, but it's at least a start. So how do you make this universal? So there is, in fact, only one additional operation that you need for universality here in this scheme. Um, and, well, it is the preparation of this state that, that Andrew mentioned. It's the eigenstate of the Pauli operator sigma x plus sigma y. And if you can prepare this state with high quality, can provide this state with high quality, then we can run universal quantum computation. And in fact, there exists a procedure for doing precisely that, and this is magic state distillation. It's, it's a protocol that breaks our, topo our, our topological construction, um, but we need to include it to achieve universality. So this is one non-topological element in the construction. Okay, so this is pretty much what I wanted to say about the gates. So let's get back to the thresholds. No, let's now discuss the characteristics of the scheme. So let's begin with the thresholds. And so uh, Andrew has already told you that we can talk about an error threshold of various levels of detail. So let the surface code over here. And in fact, so the, uh, the, code, the, 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 the thresholds for memory, they carry over as thresholds for fault-tolerant computation with the code. So there's no deduction for the fact that you're actually computing, which is something that has to be shown, of course, but this is uh, how it turns out. So the, the most elementary level uh, at which you can provide a threshold is if, if you assume that your error correction is, is actually perfect. Well, then you, if you assume that phase flip and spin flip errors are actually dependent, uh, independent, then you arrive at the threshold here of about 11%. So the next thing that you can do is take into account the errors of syndrome <coughs> measurement in a phenomen phenomenological <coughs> fashion. Then your threshold goes, goes down to about 3%. But then if you really all split it up into gates and allow a gate for each individual gate, your threshold goes down even more, but not that far. So what we end up with if we assume an error for each individual <coughs> gate is a threshold of about a percent now. 
for this uh, recent improvements of the threshold value, and this is not so bad. So let us compare this um, with, with other things. So well, first of all, I want to say, um, actually, you think this is now a region where you can actually begin to meet with experiments. So you think that an error threshold of 1%, 1 in 100 gates failing, this is something that's <coughs> probably within experimental reach. So you think it's probably <coughs> scaling up systems is the much more difficult part here. But s such accuracies should be in range. Uh, let, me, let me also compare this number with, with a number that I just learned this morning uh, from Andrew, namely the threshold for classical fault-tolerant computation is 9%. Actually, I expected it to be a bit higher. But anyway, so we are not so far away from that number. And finally, let me compare this number of 1% with the highest known threshold uh, for fault-tolerant quantum computation. This is a, a result by Manny Knill and without a geometric constraint, and that number is about 3%. So, uh, so that, that number uh, tells you, if you compare those two numbers, is that the geometric constraint, which at, at the beginning seems fairly severe, actually doesn't constrain you too much, right? It's, it's a factor of three that you are losing. Okay, so I think this is good news. So uh, let's celebrate then before we go to the next slide, which will be about overhead. Oh, oh actually, this is, a, this is a slide about the error model. Well, I, I don't want to go into it in too great detail. We can talk about it if you have questions about it. This is basically what I said, that we have a, an error for each of the involved gates. And now comes this, this slide about the overhead. So this is perhaps a bit more mixed news. So for the computer scientists, the operational overheads are poorly logarithmic. So uh, well that doesn't sound too bad. For the experimentalists, especially if you sit in the back, this is 10 to the 7, this is 10 to the 9, and so forth. So these are very, very big numbers. So let's see what's plotted here. So what we are plotting is the cost of an individual fault-tolerant quantum gate as a function of the total size of the circuit. So say if I want to do 10 to the 8 logical gates, which I might, look here for the cost of an individual fault-tolerant quantum gate. So these numbers are indeed very, very big. Uh, but I should say one thing. Those curves are at the point where our base error rate is one-third of the error threshold. So if our error rate is lower, then those curves will look better. So the scales will then change. So as I said, the overhead is poorly logarithmic, and what this means in practice is uh, the cost of a C naught uh, in a computation with 100 gates isn't, isn't very much cheaper than the cost of a fault-tolerant C-naught gate if you have 10 to the 10 gates in the computation. So the increase is mild, but you're starting at a high level. That's a problem. <coughs> so the red curve here was for the C-naught. So the, the other curves, the green and the blue, they are for gates, the one qubit gates that require magic state distillation in this protocol. So we see that they are higher. So the message is that, well, again, first for the computer scientists, uh, the scaling is unaffected. Scale, I mean, it remains poorly logarithmic. The exponent remains the same. But in absolute terms, those procedures are very, very costly. So if we can get by without them, that would be a very good thing. So they drive up the overhead in absolute terms. And this is just a pi over 8 gate here. So I leave it up to you to contemplate a solovey kataev construction on, on top of that. All right. So uh, I have one more slide on this. So I want to get back to the point um, that uh, those curves might look a lot better if we go to lower error probabilities. But on the <coughs> for this topological scheme, I didn't have a plot that would actually show it. Maybe somebody else at this conference will show such a plot later. Let me just s 
discuss what I found in the literature. So this is for Nils scheme. This is a scheme with the highest threshold. And this is not topological at all. But he plotted in his paper the, uh, the same figure, namely the cost of a, of a C naught per uh, the, the cost of an individual fault tolerant C naught as a function this time of the base error probability and now for various computational sizes. Again, 10 to the 8 sounds something we might want to shoot for. And okay, so here you see 3% is the threshold. So at one third of the threshold, you're getting something like 10 to the 11. But if you are at one hundredth of a threshold, you're already down to 10 to the 3. 10 to the 3 is still a very big number, but it is a lot better than 10 to the 11. So, I mean, I cannot guarantee that we will see the same kind of dramatic <coughs> drops in our topological scheme, but it is something to look for. So we need to, to do more ana uh, analysis. Okay, so with this comment, I want to leave uh, the surface codes and want to move on to discuss the, uh, an, another type of code, namely uh, Hector's topological uh, color subsystem codes. And the, as I said initially, I mean, the, the construction is rather spicy and has many interesting elements in it. And so before I want to put them all together, I want to discuss those elements separately in simpler settings. Oops. Okay. So the first element uh, of Bombin's construction that I consider are twists. And we can discuss twists in the more familiar surface code. But we need to, or it's ad of advantage to, to look at the surface code in a slightly different way. So what we will be doing to the code surface is two manipulations. First, um, on all qubits, uh, on horizontal edges, we, we will apply a Hadamard transformation and then rotate the code surface uh, by 45 degrees. So we, we, we then uh, end up with the letters. Oh, well, I come to that. So this is the, the two changes that I'm making. Uh, and here you see the resulting uh, operators that were the former plaquette operators and side operators. And they now look more, more similar to each other. In fact, they look exactly the same except for their location. Okay, so that is now a new lattice that we will be considering. Okay, now we color in it, just black and white for the moment. So what used to be the sides in the old lattice now becomes white plaquettes, and what used to be the, the old plaquettes will become dark plaquettes in this lattice. So this is now, this coloring is what we now want to discuss. Okay. Likewise, I mean, what we inherit, of course, from, from the previous lattice are those closed string operators uh, that, that give us an error syndrome. So, or that, that the, we can, uh, sort of, the, with the associated uh, string operators, we can measure the error syndrome. So, here you see a dark string. So, this goes around what used to be a site. So, Dark strings measure the side type stabilizer. Light strings measure the plaquette stabilizer. OK. So now let's uh, take some stuff out of this picture again. And now let's take the color back out. Just remember that one of the faces was called dark. And now we're going to do a modification to our lattice. And this will actually lead us to twists. So what we do, uh, so the twists are analogous to what were the holes in the previous construction. The difference is that now uh, a non-local manip manipulation of the lattice is needed to introduce the twist. So we are cutting the lattice open and modify the edges along the cut. And the end point of that cut is what our twist is going to be. So now after we have introduced that twist into the lattice, let's go back in. Ouch. Doesn't work anymore. So we, we fail to end up with a consistent coloring of that lattice. So we can still um, talk about 
a coloring locally, but there is a global obstruction to the, uh, to the coloring now. Namely, along this cut here, we have neighboring faces with the same color, which is forbidden by our coloring. I just, I, I just uh, want to say one thing. So um, uh, there's nothing physical about the location of the cut. I mean, locally, uh, the lattice looks perfectly fine. Um, the obstruction to a coloring is a global property. So we can move this cut anywhere around here. The only property that must, uh, we must require of the cut is that it ends in the twist. Okay. Now, let's discuss those string-like operators again that go around <coughs> in loops. So what we find now with the cut present that those string operators don't close anymore. And another, so then we ask, oh, well, what those, if they don't close anymore, what invariant meaning can we attach to their measurement? So that's a, that's a weird situation. Another property that we observe is that the string operators, when going around a twist, change color. But this string does not correspond to anything that we would want to measure. So here is an operator that we can measure. It has to go around the twice. Okay? And so I leave it, I leave the twists uh, here for a while. But um, yeah, so the point is the twists in this more elaborate construction will now uh, take the ro will take the role that the holes had earlier, okay? W and we will get back to them. So, so much about the twists, and I now continue with subsystem codes. And I, I think I can be brief because Todd already mentioned them this morning. But um, I would nonetheless refresh your memory about them. So, uh, <coughs> so he and we introduce them by example. So maybe that's, the, that's the, before we get abstract, let's uh, start with an example. So those are stabilizer codes, so we need to define the stabilizer and the encoded Pauli operators. So this is what they look like. So we ha again, we have a lattice here, the qubits living on the sides, and the stabilizer operator Z type are just two columns of Pauli operator sigma Z, and they could be anywhere. Likewise, the X type stabilizers are, or their generators, two rows of Pauli operator sigma x. Okay, the, uh, the encoded Pauli operators are just one column of individual Pauli operator sigma z and one row encoded Pauli operator sigma x. And then, of course, it doesn't matter where you place that row or that column. Yeah, and now if this was an ordinary stabilizer code, you would imagine that uh, those stabilizer operators is what's being measured to extract the syndrome, but that's not the case. Namely, what you measure uh, are operators with very small support, and that's, in fact, the point of the whole construction. You get by with measuring two local operators. So at first you think, okay, I'm getting the idea. With me, we're measuring those operators and their translates, and then by classically post-processing the measurement outcomes, namely by multiplying them together, well, we can infer the outcome that we had obtained had we measured those stabilizer generators. So far, so good, but then you notice, ouch, those operators don't commute. So what does that mean? So that's, that looks, that doesn't look good. So if I measure an operator A and then measure an operator B that doesn't commute, am I not losing the, mal the the measurement outcome of the first measurement, does this, out, this measurement outcome of the first measurement still make sense? Hmm. Yeah, that seems a little bit a peculiar situation. And actually, but what really matters is whether those operators commute with the encoded Pauli operators and with the stabilizers. And in fact, that they do. So yes, those operators are not necessarily commuting, but they will always commute 
with what we are interested in. So while we are measuring them, we are not affecting those operators. So that's good about them. But if you're still worried, and let's explain a little bit more. But that was just an example. Uh, let us now become a little bit more abstract uh, about those codes. So here, in, in the case of these codes, uh, there are uh, a couple of types of operators that we would find a group theoretical framework for. So, well, there is the stabilizer group as usual. And now, the, the operators that we measure in this scheme, they, are, they generate what's called the gauge group, and that contains the stabilizer group as a subset. And then there is the centralizer of the gauge group, that is all those Pauli operators that commute with everything in the gauge group, and they will contain, in addition to the stabilizer, all the encoded Pauli operators. So if you're still uncomfortable with the construction, then let me offer a, a bit of uh, additional uh, information here, and, and Todd already mentioned this. So yes, uh, those operators are not commuting, and they, are, they mess up certain things in our code. So in in addition to the system qubits that we are interested in protecting, we have additional qubits, which we call gauge qubits. And when we measure those operators over here, we are affecting the gauge qubits, but not the qubits we are interested in. Okay. So, point of this whole construction? Well, there is a gain and there is a loss. The gain is that we end up measuring operators that are very local. Non-local operators are hard to measure, so that's good about the construction. But there is a price to pay. And there are two, two ways of explaining this. So for example, I mean, we are discarding the gauge qubits over here. I mean, those are qubits that could, in principle, be protected, but we choose not to protect them. So our rate goes down. It doesn't matter very much. But there's another way uh, of expressing this. We could also say, well, Alternatively, those gauge qubits uh, could be prepared in fixed states, say sigma z eigenstates. And then those, their encoded Pauli operators would turn into additional stabilizer. So by choosing to measure those very small operators, what we do is in fact we discard stabilizer. That is, we choose to learn less information about our errors than we could have potentially have learned in this setting. And so we could potentially affect the error threshold for such codes. Yeah, this is what I wanted to say about subsystem codes. And now let me come to the final ingredient, the color. So the standard setting to this color in codes is color codes, which are also an, an invention by uh, uh, Bombin and Martin Delgado. So what we are looking at here is a hexagonal lattice and uh, the qubits live on the vertices of that lattice, and the underlying lattice graph has to be trivalent for the construction to work. The stabilizers are associated with the faces of the lattice, and for every face, we have two, two types of operators, z-type and x-type. Okay, and again, we're dealing with a topological quantum code, namely the number of encoded qubits that we could, can put in a code surf of without boundary is just four times the number of handles in that surface. And it's independent of the size of the surface. Okay, but um, so this red and black is not why those codes are called color codes. So now color comes into play. So what we can do here with, this co with, this, with those codes is to color the faces such that no neighboring faces have the same color. And what color does for us, it is a convenient bookkeeping device. So as always in those topological quantum codes, the operators that we are interested in, namely the stabilizer generators and uh, the encoded Pauli operators correspond to strings. And now, having colored the faces, we can color those string operators as well. So string operator that goes across the green faces, and therefore we call it a green string. Likewise, this is a string operator that goes across the blue faces, and so we call it a blue string, and so on and so forth. Um, and as before, those string operators can be deformed 
without affecting the operator that, re that they represent. That's this rule over here. But now there's something in addition. And now you see why color becomes useful for those codes. Those strings can also splice up and then merge again and then continue as one string. So what we have here in addition, this is something that we didn't have in the surface code, is vertices where multiple strings can meet, where three strings can meet. But there is a constraint. Not every triple of strings can meet in a vertex. They must have different color. They must all have different color. And to take care of that, you see that color becomes a useful bookkeeping device here. So let us now put all these ingredients together uh, and let me review uh, those topological color subsystem codes. Okay, so we begin with a hexagonal lattice, pretty much the same as we had uh, for the color code, but now differences are beginning to appear. So we have, we have to place our qubits first, and this is done as follows. So for every site in the original lattice, we put three qubits here <coughs> in this fashion. So this is our location of qubits. And now, this being subsystem codes, there are, qu there are a number of questions to address. We need to ask, what is uh, the gauge group? What is the stabilizer? What is the centralizer? Those are the encoded Pauli operators. Okay, so let's begin with the gauge group. So, uh, as in the case of the Bacon Shore code, the, the elements or the generators of the gauge group will be too local. And they will be, um, on those short links here, they will be operators sigma z, sigma z. And on those long links here, they will be sigma y, sigma x. But there's only one such generator for each long link. So there's an orientation question involved here. And you, you can figure it out. Uh, from this little diagram here, so you have a Y here and an X over here. Likewise, you have, for this edge, you have the Y sitting here and the X sitting over here. Okay, so that was the gauge group. Next element, we need uh, to talk about the centralizer, which will give us the stabilizer as a particular set, but a subgroup, but also all the encoded operators. So at this point, as a graphical device or bookkeeping device, we introduce the notion of a consistent shading, <coughs> which is the following. Thank you. Um, which is something like this. So we, we can uh, introduce shadings for our Pauli operator separately. So the Pauli operator sigma z is only shading the edges in our decorated lattice. Uh, the identity shades nothing, and the Pauli operator sigma x and sigma mo mo y, they shade edges and also corners of those faces. And now a consistent shading is a shading where every triangular face here is consistently shaded. That is, <coughs> it's either completely shaded or not shaded at all. And every such arrangement, uh, of consistent shadings, well, I can, using this table, translate back into a Pauli operator and, and every such consistent shading will correspond to an element in the centralizer and will give us an encoded Pauli operator of our code, which could be the identity. Yeah, so this is a way of representing this, the centralizer in, in that lattice. Now there is a level of abstraction or a clarification, we can translate every shading into a string net. So this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And what we basically do is we, we relocate uh, every qubit here to the, uh, to the next site, which is in this example is just here. And then, so that means all those edges are relocated uh, and that gives us those strings and or gives us a string net. And now the color of those strings is inherited from the color of those plaquettes over here. So uh, let me just, <coughs> uh, yeah, so uh, let me see, can I, yeah, so for example, this string becomes this string and it inherits its color from, from this green plaquette over here. So if we are looking 
um, let me see, let, if we are looking at those two line elements, they become this green string. And why is it green? green? Because this line element and this line element, they become mapped to the same string segment, and red plus blue gives green. Okay, just uh, as a little bit of explanation where this color comes in. Next thing we have to talk about as a subgroup of the centralizer, the stabilizer. Okay, so like in the conventional uh, surface code, we have two stabilizers for each plaquette. So there's a Z-type stabilizer, which <coughs> looks like that, and then stabilizer generator involving X and Y Pauli operators, which looks a little bit more complicated. Okay. So that has, that describes so far the subsystem aspects of this code. So now, where are the twists? <coughs> and what is a twist, after all? A twist is a face with an odd number of edges around it. So what you can see here, whenever we have a twist in the lattice, this messes up our coloring scheme. So that corresponds with the twist that we saw earlier in the simpler example of the surface code. So as soon as we have twists, there's no longer uh, a consistent coloring. And like before, we have cuts going out of the twists towards infinity. And along that cut, we have faces of same color meeting. Other thing is that for the twists, there only remains one stabilizer generator. And the, the other one uh, is inconsistent. So the number of qubits doesn't change, number of stabilizer generators goes down, so we make room for encoded qubits. <coughs> okay. So far, my discussion was based on the shadings, and let's now abstract a little bit more and go from the shadings to the string nets. So here is what happens if you move a string around a twist. So let's do this in the example where the twist is of red color. So a red string doesn't change at all. A green string is converted into a blue string, and a blue string is converted into a green string. So when we have a string operator going around the twist, in general, the colors of the strings are permuted. Okay. And now let me finally come to explain where the encoded qubits are and how we do gates here in this fashion. And this will now, with a lot more preparation necessary, look very similar to what we saw earlier in the case of the surface code. So one example uh, of getting encoded qubits here is using four twists uh, for one encoded qubit. And what you see here is the encoded Pauli operator sigma x, and this string operator corresponds to the encoded Pauli operator sigma z. What I was not explaining earlier, so um, when, when strings cross and you exchange the order of the operators, you get a plus sign if those strings are of the same color and a minus sign if the strings are of different color. So that's why those string operators reproduce the commutation relation that you expect for sigma z and sigma x. Now, if you take two encoded qubits, each consisting of four twists of different color, you can perform an entangling gate in this following fashion. So fairly similar to what we saw in the simpler example before, but this time it is the twists that are being moved, not holes. So we take twist number three and four of the, of the first qubit and take them on a journey and pass them through here between the, third and the, se and the, the second and the third twist of the second qubit and put them back into their original positions. Okay. So this, it, it turns out, uh, will perform an entangling gate for us. And we can analyze it in a very similar fashion to what we saw earlier. So under this deformation, the encoded Z operator becomes this thing. So um, then, how can we manipulate this string over here? So um, this green string doesn't actually see those defects. So this defect is, uh, is of importance only to blue and red string. So we can actually retract it 
and end up with a situation like this. And now furthermore, we can introduce a stabilizer generator over here where the surface is, surface is perfectly fine and convert this situation to this situation. So now we can go back to our table up here and see that the z-type operator has been converted to what it was initially times an x-type string operator uh, on the second qubit. Again, the important point over here is that a local operator has been changed to a two-local operator if we're referring to different qubits. And this is the signature of an entangling gate. And if you, I mean, you can deal with the other Pauli operators in completely the same fashion, and you figure out that this is a, an X-controlled spin flip gate, so comparable to a C naught gate. But uh, how have we improved over the previous construction of the surface code? Well, it turns out that with this code, we can now implement the entire Clifford group uh, in a topological fashion. That doesn't make us universal, but we are better than what we, than what we were before, and we can therefore expect that this code will give us significantly lower overheads. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done any simulation in this regard, but maybe we actually hear something about that uh, here at this conference. So this is the material that I wanted to review today, and I hope I made you curious, those constructions. So uh, let me summarize. So I mean, it, it gets even, how many minutes have I left? Am I? Oh, I think I'm one minute. Okay, let me just close up. It gets wilder than this. So uh, as uh, uh, Andrew already mentioned, there are the two Vero codes uh, in which you can do the entire, uh, that are universal by themselves. You, d you don't need any uh, non-topological helper constructions, but they are not stabilizer mm -hmm. codes. Probably more difficult to realize. Okay, let me just summarize. If you have a two local architecture and two dimensions, topological quantum codes are probably the best way uh, to go about this scenario. We, we are seeing very, very high threshold numbers. Overheads at this point want to be reduced, and therefore uh, we are looking at quantum codes. But in principle, uh, what the method that I've shown you is uh, of particular relevance, I would say, to array, arrays of Jodless and Junction qubits, but also cold odd atoms in uh, optical lattices, and to a lesser se extent, also to segmented ion traps. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? So the question was, how do I actually envision those braiding operations? What would physically need to be done? <coughs> and I mean, this is not topological quantum computation. So in our case, moving those holes or twists is actually a simple uh, operation. So what you just need to do is a bunch of measurements. So we would be, say, I have no, I, uh, no board here. Um, so what we would do at one side of the hole, say, let's talk about holes, um, you would do uh, measurements that destroy the stabilizers, and, uh, and on the other side of the hole, you would do stabilizer measurements to repair the code surface. So it's a little bit like a, I, I think snakes walk like that. So you're extending uh, your hole on one side, repairing the surface at the other and move the hole in this fashion. So this is by standard operations. This is all done by, in either case, both holes and twists. This is all done by one and two qubit gates. So you need nothing in addition. Y yes, Austin, I think that is. Okay, can I just, I think I, I just want to repeat the comment. Um, the comment was that in the surface code states, you can still do the entire Clifford group without magic state distillation. That was the comment. Yes, 
Okay, thank you very much for that comment. Yes? Uh, I'll just say a clarifying comment on that. In my talk here, the slides will be available online, but there is a circuit that will allow you to reuse the magic tape or the S tape over and over again. Mm -hmm. You do need to distill it, but you just need to distill it once. Mm -hmm. um, but for the surface dose. Yeah. So that's a comment. Now I'll ask you a question, actually. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the twist example that you gave, you had red being invariant and blue and green swapping to do your construction. Yes. There are I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I think it's probably a better question for Hector. Um, I mean, I was not claiming optimality here I I in any way. I mean, I'm not, sh I'm not even sure that this four twists per qubit is optimal. So maybe you can do it with less. Um, the, the main point I wanted to make about uh, those codes is that you can do the entire Clifford group in a topological fashion. So how much that buys you in the end, in terms of overhead, I think has to be analyzed in more detail. Yeah? Okay, so go ahead. Hector, oh. question. Abstract uh, answer is that the tools that he was discussing are enough to generate those more, uh, you know, like these permutations that we are mentioning, like they are combinations of these more elementary twists, that's why. I mean, you don't need to. I mean, uh, they are already there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you again. <laughs> now we'll continue our tutorials with uh, Daniel Ador, who will talk about dynamical decoupling.